Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Mariano Rupertus, and I will be the host of this webinar titled The External Reality in the Consultation Room. Research between psychoanalysis and neuroscience is historical. They have fascinated a large generation of psychoanalysts, from Sigmund Freud onward to understanding the relationship between external and internal reality, the general working of the mind and the role of the unconscious. In that sense, the relationship between the brain, subjectivity and the unconscious and the environment will be discussed. Today, we have three outstanding colleagues and researchers as guests. Tiziano Colibazzi from USA, Francisco Parada from Chile, and Rosa Spagnolo from Italy. So, before handing over the presentation to our panelists, I will explain, explain briefly the format of how this webinar is going to function. It was two sections. In the first section, each of or two uh, of each panelist will be around 10 minutes presentation. The second section is a question and answer portion devoted to the free exchange of select question and idea with the panelists and the attendees. You will find a questions box on the right side of the screen. If you would like to ask a question, please write it in this box. You can post your question throughout the whole course of the webinar from the very beginning. Please remember that question will not be answered until after our three presentations from the panelists have been completed. Now, we are ready to begin. Let me introduce you to Tiziano Colibazzi, a native of Rome, Italy, Tiziano Colibatti, medical doctor, is an associate clinical professor of psychiatry at Columbia University and a training and supervised analyst at the Columbian Center of Psychoanalysis Training and Research. Well, he serves as research co-chair. His presentation is titled, Is a Reality a Thing? Please, Tiziano, go ahead. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, my name is Tiziano Colibazzi. Uh, I'm also from Rome, Italy, uh, in addition to New York. Um, so uh, it's uh, my presentation will focus uh, basically on three angles. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the historical uh, evolution of the term reality, um, the sort of polysemic, ambiguous nature of the word, uh, then I'm going to briefly uh, discuss some models uh, of uh, neuroscientific models uh, with which external reality has been explained. And I'm going to uh, talk uh, about the research I've done um, studying external reality more specifically in patients that have a, so to speak, uh, break with reality, psychotic patients, or that deform or distort reality um, based on primitive defense mechanisms such as splitting, with which you're, uh, I'm sure all familiar. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about the importance of addressing reality, um, both uh, in individual treatment uh, and uh, since I'm a couple and sex therapist, also when it comes to couples issue where it's particularly urgent. Um, next slide. Um, uh, great. So um, just out of curiosity, um, I looked up how the word reality came into being. Um, it's actually a neologism, less than a thousand year old, by this philosopher called Dan Scotus, uh, who was a scholastic uh, philosopher. And it comes from the word res, which means thing. Now, just to give you a sense how deceptive the term reality is, the meaning um, that uh, was intended at that time is completely different than what we have today, where it's usually understood as objective reality as opposed to subjective reality. At that time, it was just what made individual things individual, like uh, you know, this particular 
you know, cup of coffee that I have here, this one, as opposed to the general idea of cup of coffee. So um, I'm not going to obviously cover all that has been uh, discussed, but external reality has been uh, defined uh, in many different ways. Um, using the concept of existence, causal power, mind independence, uh, non-illusoriness, and genuineness. Um, next slide. So just to give you a sense of the semantic um, ambiguity of the word and its polysemic nature, I just put some antinomies and um, a pairs of words uh, with which reality is usually um, uh, linked uh, reality versus imaginary reality versus fantasy reality is something stable uh, versus a phenomenon that's changeable reality is objectivity uh, reality is fundamental even reality is legitimacy think about patients that come in hey doctor you know my pain is real uh, what does the word real mean here? They mean legitimate, for instance, or uh, classic a couple's therapy is, let me tell you how things really went, or this is the real story about our marriage. Uh, so there is a claim and a demand um, about reality. So in this case, reality is a demand. It's a sort of pressure. Um, so just keep these meanings in mind. So the term reality has evolved over the last thousand years, uh, has been subject to extensive philosophical elaboration. Neuroscience is kind of a late comer, but uh, has made important contributions. And also, um, uh, synchronically in the moment in the consulting room, uh, it's always good to think about what is the patient meaning by reality. Uh, where, what plane of reality, external reality is the patient uh, positioning themselves uh, so that they're telling me what they're telling me. Uh, and you can see it in psychosis especially. Um, next slide. So let's look at some of the ways neuroscience and, uh, you know, in general, thinking in uh, the Western world has thought about reality. I mean, it all starts obviously all the time with Aristotle. Um, reality makes an impression. It's a very simple model. Reality makes an impression on our mind. Uh, the mind changes state. And uh, such change in the state of our mind is uh, symbolized through language. So we have usually three terms. We have the thing, the subject, mind, soul, whatever it is, and we have the words. Um, according to Aristotle and a lot of thinkers, and I'm talking about it because it influences and frames the debate today, um, we know we can apprehend the object, we can comprehend the object like the apple, the cup of coffee, because the mind creates or changes in a way that corresponds to, that is similar to, that is adequate to the apple, uh, the cup of coffee externally. Uh, in some theories, this image, this object is recreated in the mind and that's how we know it. The reason why I'm talking about this is that um, the problem of external reality is usually framed of a problem of representation because we need a bridge between the object and the subject. And this representation has been thought to be, you know, various natures. It can be like transparent. So it's a one-to-one -one correspondent. It can be translucent. Maybe there's a deformation. It can be uh, opaque if the correspondence, the sort of fidelity of the internal representation is not perfectly matched. Uh, and we use these concepts all the time when we think about object and self-representation, we think about the distortion of such representation based on the emotional state of the patient. Um, so against this background, uh, there are two models, and I think Rosa will talk a lot about uh, models of external reality um, that have been used in order to frame the problem. There's a professor at NYU, I'm probably going to mispronounce his name, Georgi Buzaki, uh, who um, has provided two important framework to understand external reality. The, First is the outside-in framework, and there are all the models where mm -hmm. reality is apprehended from the outside-in. And the second frame is the inside-out, where the brain has a more active role. Now, these are all simplifications, but um, be that as it may, 
in the outside in models, we understand the world because the world makes these impressions on the brain and creates a sort of representation in our head. Now, the best example from neuroscience would be vision, for instance, where um, different populations of neurons react to different properties of the object, like direction, luminosity, um, uh, shape, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, these uh, different characters or traits of the object are then synthesized progressively in secondary cortices, um, and so we get the image of the object in our head. But again, it's a construction that starts from the simple to the more complex. Um, these features are bound together by the brain and the object is presented then to us as a mental object. Now it's interesting the word presentation because we usually use the word representation. Um, so on the other hand, uh, there are the outside, the inside out model, sorry, that posit that the brain has more of an active role in shaping uh, external reality. So we come to understand the world through actions, whatever is, you know, seeing kids, you know, kids take objects, manipulate objects, um, understand objects through the use that they have for them. Um, and perception in this sense is bound uh, with action. And uh, the brain uh, is kind of, and that's one of the um, important models that has evolved, the model of the brain as a prediction machine. So the brain acts as a predictor. So it predicts the causes of sensory signal. Um, so top-down mechanism, meaning from the frontal cortex down, mm -hmm. uh, convey perceptual predictions. So they tell you tell you, hey, look, uh, I mean, I think that is uh, a cup of coffee. I think it's gonna be warm. I think it's gonna have this particular taste. So the brain makes these predictions. And then it matches it with the bottom up, the signal that come from the periphery of the body, the tongue in this case, the nose. Um, it matches them and it calibrates those uh, predictions so that, um, we keep our predictions controlled by the sensory signals. That's how we anchor our predictions. Uh, in this case, obviously, there is uh, an interaction between top down and bottom up processes. Now, um, Anil said, um, has written an interesting article talking about another neuroscientist about the brain as a prediction machine, uh, and has talked about perceptions as controlled hallucinations, meaning that um, they are basically hallucinations of the brain, like predictions. Uh, we also call them priors, like assumption uh, about what the external reality is like. And these predictions are controlled because they're yoked by sensory data. Now, um, hallucinations, on the other hand, are uncontrolled perceptions uh, where these kind of priors are not yoked to sensory data and someone starts hearing voices or misinterpreted things and uh, that also explains why in psychosis in particular a lot of people have uh, looked at hallucinations and normal perceptions on a continuum. Uh, now this is all to say that perception is an interactive process with the outside, according to these models, to which I subscribe, rather than the recreation of the outside in the mind. Now, having said that, um, even the division subject, object, external, internal is, uh, you know, has to be questioned. Um, and, you know, from Heidegger to Merleau-Ponty have already said that it doesn't make any sense to take to talk about the subject abstracted from the world because it's in the world uh, when it emerges. So, you know, these are just frames that are useful to think about stuff. So how, uh, next slide. Actually, no, stay on this slide, I'm sorry. Stay on the previous slide uh, for a moment. Thank you. Um, so how did I approach this in my own work? So I looked at adolescents at high risk for psychosis. So these are people that have not developed psychosis yet, but they kind of go in and out subthreshold psychotic symptoms. So for instance, they may, you know, look outside the consulting room and see a tree moving in the wind uh, where the branches are kind of waving and they say, oh, someone's waving at me. Um, so they're not like fixed psychotic symptoms, but they're kind of going in and out. Um, the other um, area of study has been, as I said, the distortion of external reality through primitive defenses such as splitting, uh, for instance, and borderlines, but 
you know, uh, with latest example of polarizations in our uh, civic life, we have a sort of group level uh, model of that. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Thank you. In individuals at high risk for psychosis, we did some brain imaging. Um, not going to like go into the sausage making as it were, uh, but we have identified marker of vulnerability uh, to psychosis and marker of symptoms. Those are two different things. Uh, now, if you look at um, the map of the brain, just forget about the bottom part, look at the top part, uh, those little areas are temporal areas of the brain, um, usually devoted to language. Uh, I mean, uh, auditory recognition, et cetera, et cetera. So what you see, we studied the connectivity of the brain um, with the rest of the brain. And we looked at areas of the brain, uh, the connectivity of which is significantly associated to risk status. And you can see that people at high risk for psychosis um, have abnormal connections of those areas which are language areas and then we try to follow it up and see what they link to and at the bottom their follow-up analyses and that little bright spot in the middle of the brain um, is called the thalamus that's a kind of sensor relay all the sensations from the body go into the thalamus i mean simplistically speaking and then they're distributed across the cortex so what does this mean it means that people at high risk for psychosis it appears that they have strengthened or at the very least abnormal connection between sensory relay centers um, and again collecting uh, sensory modalities from across the body transmitting them to the higher centers and the language areas so there is an increased connection next slide uh, we then looked at um, symptoms you know we looked at what areas of the brain are abnormal um, and what connectivity abnormalities are related to psychosis, psychotic symptoms such as delusions, hallucinations. We see that it's a different type of area, frontal area, cognitive control area. So those kind of top down, uh, maybe more abstract thinking um, mm -hmm. sort of area. And so here um, it seems that uh, we have, again, the risk of psychosis is increased, you know, tightness between language and thing and symptoms are related to this kind of uh, abnormal collection we could speculate it's loosening of cognitive control um based on another study that we did on this kind of um on this kind of systems and here i want to bring up um and we can go back two slides the work of silvano arieti who wrote interpretation of schizophrenia in 1955 it's a terrific book i think um in which he discusses psychosis and the break with reality not so much as a break with reality but as a sort of perceptualization of words uh while the class level concept like the more abstract kind of ideas like the apple the good the bad the coffee like the non-individual stuff um is kind of deficient um and so what i found interesting in the study uh it made me think how in psychosis there is a sort of fusion perhaps and again this is speculative of percepts and words uh that then invade consciousness this is a thesis that um has been also um proposed by uh, the former director of the Analytic Institute at Columbia, Eric Marcus, in his book, uh, Psychosis and Neuropsychosis. And also, if you ever read uh, Marguerite Sechet, she's a psychoanalyst from the 50s, uh, Journal d'une Schizophrenie, Diary of a Schizophrenia, talks about symbolic realization. Um, so we have probably, um, many of us had this experience in the consulting room, where um, in psychosis, words are treated as things and things are treated as words um, in a manner similar, actually, how language is used in poetry. So, um, so what this study made me think is that external reality here is still there, but there is a recalibration rather than a break with reality where sort of the weight is more towards a sensory, emotional, concrete percept. Now, um, two slides down, uh, if you can go two slides forward, sorry. Um, 
I'm going to just briefly talk about this. We have studied splitting, uh, the defense mechanism where everybody is good or bad or the same person is, you know, doctor, you were a great doctor yesterday and today you're an absolute monster and so on and so forth. So we're very familiar with splitting and personality disorders. Now we have studied splitting using automated language analysis um, in collaboration with IBM. And um, without going into the details of the graphic, I can go into that later. We have noticed that when we ask people to describe themselves and other significant people in their lives, um, the more the splitting, uh, the more basically there's a spread in the positive versus negative valence of these words that we analyze. So the more the splitting, the more the negative affect. And the more the negative affect, the more the difficulty in consolidating an identity of these patients. So to make a long story short, it's interesting how we can study reality also not only in terms of psychosis and neuropsychosis, but also in terms of how defenses distort reality. And it sounds like negative affectivity uh, contributes to splitting and makes these uh, self and other representations unstable because we notice that the more people split, they mo the, the more they reverse from positive to negative. So um, next slide. So what does you know, at least what are some ideas that I've had, um, you know, coming from uh, the sort of background where I'm in the uh, consulting room. Uh, first, I think there is no internal versus external reality. I don't mean that there's no reality. Like if you don't pay your electric bill, they're going to just, you know, disconnect your electricity. If you run in front of a car, you're probably going to end up dead. Um, however, um, the distinction is a little more complicated. Reality is more of a process that emerges uh, from internal and external processing that collide together, um, almost like as if quantum physics would have it, like things come after interactions. So these processes interact and whatever comes out of the interaction or stands out, um, then is the reality we're dealing with now. Um, now, it's interesting because the word existed, it comes actually from the word in Latin, it means standing out. So ultimately, what stands out in our mind is the result of all of these processes, uh, and it's a dynamic interaction. Now, it's, I find it particularly useful because in object relations theory, which I frequently used, uh, in the treatment of personality disorder, we tend to think of internal representations as homunculi, like little statuettes, little like rigid thing. In reality, it's kind of a flux. We intuitively know this. It depends on the transference, counter-transference. These are internal realities that are constantly molded. Reality is also plural. There's no like external reality, but there are like fields of reality um limited in space and time and they're really sensitive to context and goals like when a patient comes in when they say that my pain is my reality clearly the goal is to get empathy get maybe more treatment be believed so again the plane of reality in the room um, depends on the context and on the goals which makes sense because the brain would make predictions based on you know what the context and the goals are and if you think about the psychoanalytic setting through a set of specific rules establishes a particular species of reality for therapeutic purposes um, the other thing that's interesting about this is that psychoanalysis and psychotherapy allows us to move between planes of reality uh, in a very interesting way if you recall uh, freud's paper on transference love uh, when um, freud uh, discusses this uh, transference love, the question is, is this love real? And Freud's answer is yes and no at the same time. So psychoanalysis allows us through this sort of psychoanalytic setting to maybe expand uh, these intermediate states of reality. So external reality is an ambiguous concept, as I said. Um, I see it all the time in couples uh, where, you know, let me tell you how things really were. He really doesn't love me. So uh, here the word reality is used in different ways. That's a fundamental truth or as a claim to legitimacy, like my version is true. And I find it very helpful clinically to reframe external reality based on that list that I gave you at the beginning. Like, what do you mean? Like, it means that, you know, he's not hearing you. It means that he thinks it's not legitimate. You mean, et cetera, et cetera. So 
uh, it's a very helpful sort of concept to reflect upon. Um, the other area that I found interested, uh, interesting is sexuality, where because couples don't communicate about sex, the these a fusion of percept and words tend to be extremely powerful and exciting. So there is words acquire sensory signal, a sensory uh, flavor. I uh, imagine you know the power of dirty talk in some of these couples. Um, so um, I think uh, you know the last comment I want to make before concluding is that let's not confuse external reality. Um, I'm continuing to use the word external, um, but let's not confuse reality at the moment, what the patient is choosing to inhabit, with the feeling of reality, which can be attributed to things or experiences or memories um, in ways that are not really linked. Um, you know, to what's going on. Um, so, you know, like I don't usually, you know, talk about psychic reality specifically because of this, because reality, according, I mean, to me, is all psychic in some ways. Um, so, but again, we have to, you know, sometimes use the word external, internal, especially, you know, when you treat a severe personality disorder, for instance, you need external reality corroboration. You know, what is the patient doing in the family? Are they driving everybody crazy? Or so in that case, my goal is to treat the patient improve psychosocial functioning. And so my definition of reality in the room is a little different. Again, it depends on context and goal and is weighted more heavily, for instance, in this case, towards corroboration. Um, so that's... Uh, pretty much it and uh, thank you so much for your time. Sorry if I went a little bit over, I feel. Thank you, Tiziano, for your very interesting presentation. Our next speaker is Francisco Parada. Francisco Parada studied psychology and neuroscience in Chile. He moved to the uh, United States to obtain his PhD in cognitive psychology and neural science at the, the Department of Psychological and Brain Science, Indiana University, Bloomington. Today, he working as a professor of the psychology at Univers Universidad Diego Portales and established the Center of the Human Neuroscience and Neuropsychology, Multiply Neuroscience of Cognition Research Center and Day Clinic for Brain Lesions Survivors to the development of the transdisciplinary for e-cognition research program. His presentation is, does the construction of reality depend on individual processes? Francisco, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so can you put the slide, please? So there you go. So does the construction of reality depend on individual processes? I wanted to, uh, put these thoughts to you, present these thoughts to you uh, in order to kind of like uh, put a little bit of tension in this idea that basically uh, reality is being constructed by individual processes because it seems that everybody starts from there. That's kind of like the uh, Tiziano very well uh, showed is this uh, the philosopher Aristotle that is going to be kind of like presenting it. Next slide please. And, and the, the fact that basically reality gets constructed is mainly through an anthropogenic approach. What do I mean by anthropogenic? So basically all the, um, the solutions, all the perspectives, all the objects that we're going to be building, they are built from a completely uh, anthropocentric view. They are generated from humans. Um, for the sake of time, of course, I won't go into each one of these uh, characteristics of the anthropogenic approach, but basically and the one that is most important is that cognition will occur ontologically in the brain, which means that cognition is a process, as um, Tiziano also uh, put very clearly, it's a concept of a representation, you see? So uh, it's a problem where there is some computation in the brain and that's where reality is being constructed. And that's uh, primarily anthropogenic. Psychology has been very, uh, from my point of view, very problematically uh, into this because basically most psychological theories are anthropogenic. Uh, they don't work when you come out of the, of the scope, when you give them an evolutionary uh, approach. Most of these uh, theories don't work. They're exclusive for humans. 
And this idea, the other concept, as, as I was telling you, I won't go into each one of these aspects because for the sake of time, but the other, the other uh, significant point is the idea of adaptivity. So basically, cognition, this, this thing that is going to be happening there, this process that's happening inside your brain is going to be promoting adaptive behavior. Adaptive behavior, again, happens as something that comes from within. Uh, and uh, as Tiziano also very well said, uh, there are people like uh, Marlo Monti or the predictive processing or predictive coding uh, portion or theory of the brain um, gives provides some tension here because basically it's an interaction process as um, Tiziano very well uh, gave in, in, in his last point. Please, uh, next, next slide. Uh, there we have the individual, basically. You see, the, the creation of the individual. And I really like, I'm, I'm kind of like a history buff because basically I really like going back to history because then you see that everything that has been said was said by someone. And that someone uh, might be just starting with the wrong principles. So when we think about the individual, which is the centerpiece of our society and, uh, and our, our solutions, basically, our mental health issues and all the public policy we live with, um, this is something that starts in Europe, in Europe you know, after the, the fall of the feudal system in the European medieval communes, we have this um, around a period of like 500 years when the first machines appeared, the first patents, uh, and with all that, the bourgeois basically coming, a new social actor, an individualist, a protector of intellectual and material property. So basically, then everything else comes, comes uh, from this uh, very precious uh, concept of the individual. However, uh, and, and that's what I would like to just uh, present this idea to you. It might be an anthropocentric idea. It might be an anthropogenetic idea. Please, next slide. Some of the classic, um, next slide, please. There we go. Uh, some of the classic criteria for individuality. Of course, I won't be able to go uh, through all of them. Uh, structural individu individuality. My body is my own, and this is what makes me an individual, developmental individuality, physiological, genetic, immune even. We can actually continue doing a list of things that we're going to be uh, thinking that they are the, the actual fingerprint of being an individual. Next slide, please. I'm going to just grab structural um, and um, next, there we go, a structural individuality. So basically, the, uh, when you get out of the anthropogenic approach, if you find one species that doesn't, that your rule or your theory doesn't apply to, you need to revise the theory, not neglect the, 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 the species, basically. So uh, the sea sponges are animals, you know, um, that are composed by several organisms. Um, can we talk about an, an individual in the case of this uh, sponge? In some cases, more than 40% of the volume of this animal is composed by bacteria. Give me the next slide, please. Um, on the other hand, we have um, this cow, you know, a highly complex big mammal, because you would say maybe the sponge is too old, you know, phylogenetically speaking. So this idea that the characteristic biophysical structure doesn't apply to bigger animals. The cow have a complex and diverse ecosystem of communities, the bacteria and fungi, etc., that they are going to be central for digestion. Uh, these microorganisms will inform the anatomy of the, of the cow, will define the physiology, will regulate the behavior, and even determine the evolution of the cow. Well, you might say the these are lower animals. There's nothing like humans. Next slide, please. And in the next slide, we will can see that actually this applies, of course, of course, this applies to humans. Uh, in humans, 90% of the cells of the body correspond to other bacteria. 150 more or less different species of bacteria live in the human body. Um, and, and these are going to be in the respiratory tract, in the skin, mouth, reproductive orifices, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. So structurally speaking, um, humans and a lot of other animals 
are not actually individuals. This very same um, argument or this very same exercise can be done for developmental, physiological, genetic, and immune, and some other ones. So um, next slide, please. Of course, I won't do that because I only have like five minutes or less. And uh, so when you look at the tree of life, the, the beginnings in the center, the beginnings of uh, this bacterial life, and you see the semicircle, all the little lines that go into the semicircle are the current model of that species. And humans are on the bottom right, that little, little, little point. Why would we think that all these species that are here, well, even though they are the latest evolutionary model of that species, why would we have special mechanisms and special uh, functions for building reality, just us. I don't think we're so special. So um, next slide, please. When you, get, uh, when you get out of the anthropogenic approach, now the different uh, types of interactions, are they genetic, neural, social, whatever, will have to be embedded in context, as Tiziano very well said. So when I'm thinking about developmental stages, the genetic interactions might be very, very, very important. But then in adulthood, probably those uh, genetic interactions are, are not so important. Social and neural might be relevant. Uh, next slide, please. So the concept that I want to uh, just uh, leave there on the, on the table for discussion and, and so on is the, this idea of what are we instead if we are not individuals? Um, so holobionts is a word, it sounds a little bit of a mouthful, but uh, biology basically is, is kind of like pointing towards that uh, evidence. Uh, we have a host, we have a, it can be an animal, it can be a, a plant, um, where it's composed by the, the actual genes that are going to be uh, typical of that species. However, living in the world gives you this access to this symbiotic way of life, basically. And we are not, we cannot think even uh, of, of animals and plants without thinking about multi-partite entities resulting from all these super complex uh, processes. Uh, please, next slide. The animals can be certainly, and, and plants can be thought of holobionts, but also the places where we inhabit. So we can actually talk about urban holobionts. And there's a super nice uh, line of research, research there where the agent and the organisms that live there all forms a discrete ecological unit. Um, some uh, theories there say that maybe wild and rural uh, places um, are more protective or more propensive to health than uh, industrial urban uh, situations. This is something that mental health um, double clicking into public policy. I think this is a very interesting argument because it, it, it puts it out there with uh, discussing public policy. Please, next slide. As uh, I'm actually uh, running out of time, but we can, there's technology now uh, that is also living with us. And uh, research shows that actually uh, our technological devices, phones and whatnot, share actually some of these bacteria, almost predicting 100% of, of places in our body. So maybe we can talk about in the future technological holobionts. Please, next slide. Um, and, and we can do this, this exercise for the holobionts, these microbiomes that we're going to be generating in, in our ecological niche and uh, defining basically our um, physiological dynamics. So uh, let's go to the next slide and several of them because I won't go uh, through each of one of my points. So please click, 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 click several times where the biogenic approach to reality, there you go, you have one more to go, that's it. So we have uh, this, oh, can you go back one, please? There you go. So we have the biogenic approach to reality, uh, an approach that might make more sense nowadays, uh, putting together the phenomenological aspects of reality and the evidence that comes from biology, neuroscience, and all the other sciences, making um, a peace with the phylogenetic continuity, stopping leaving the humans outside, like they are super, super special, and uh, making um, a cognition uh, with a reciprocal, reciprocal and causal link 
with the environment. And this is so important nowadays uh, uh, with, the, with the climate change and whatnot. So please uh, give me the next slide. Um, when we are talking about the models that we are moving from, so we have these very early models in input-output in neuroscience, and we're moving towards more embedded um, um, models. These are adapted from Randy Beer's uh, research. Please give me one more click, and we're going to have basically a model that might explain or might be a little bit more um, more just it will do justice basically to the complexity of uh, people as organisms that are going to be part of this bigger system maybe in mental health and with this i finish um, maybe the, the notion of individual might be a nice metaphor but what happens when we actually uh, freed up from that and one more click and thank you to all the people that work with me and especially my postdoc ismail who does all the super interesting um, work, experimental work on bacteria and stuff. Thank you. Well, many thanks, Francisco, for your presentation. Now, our last guest is Rosa Espanolo, medical doctor, is now a psychiatrist for children, child and adolescent psychotherapist, psychoanalyst, and full member of the Italian Psychoanalytical Society. She currently lives in works in Rome. She is the co-founder and co-chair of the Italian Psychoanalytic Dialogues Association and the organizer of the annual EPD Rome Conference. Her presentation titled The External Reality from Within, Blurred Boundaries. Thank you, Rosa. Okay, thank you, Mariana, for this uh, invitation. I'm going to sum up uh, this webinar uh, and I'm going to give you some idea, a few statements about a few models because uh, we have uh, the landscape surrounding the psychoanalysis about the brain mind model. We have a lot of models. So I choose to talk about the most relevant models uh, at this moment in the neuroscience. Next uh, slide please and the next one next one okay starting uh, i just introduced to you this a uh, few model maybe uh, one model uh, you know this model by vittorio gallese and damasio called image making mapping then we are going to talk about generative code and prediction inferential mind and uh, multisensual integration and finally finally i just give you some idea about the temporal temporal spatial structure of the self. Uh, we know Freud describing the functioning of psychic reality tried to shed light on its connection with external reality. He was really interesting in the connection with external reality in uh, many books or uh, he wrote about this. So when we perceive it, today we can say, when we perceive external reality, we perceive it through the lens of internal reality. Today we call this first person perspective. Today we call this subjectivity. So we know every object or event which we can perceive can be seen from two points of view the internal point of view or the external point of view. So, in other words, what is at stake at this moment is knowing how material reality becomes internalized and how a reality that is initially external, completely external, becomes a subjective and the opposite, a reality, subjectivity, reality, first person perspective, externalize out, to, the, to Tiziano said, inside out and outside in, externalize this one so we can conceive the reality as external. So how we construct the reality by the internal reality, through the internal reality. Next one. Starting from uh, Gallese, Vittorio Gallese, and his model about mirror neuron system and about the simulation, attunement, and so on, he said being human not only means uh, 
experience a physical reality, but also conceiving fictional worlds, many fictional worlds. He said, we live in relation to other people and objects present in our real world, but we live as well in relation to people and objects that are part of our imaginary fictional world. Indeed, he said, experiencing an emotion and imagining this is the model of embodied uh, simulation uh, are both support, uh, supported by the same relative, relative same uh, ident identical circuits. Similarly, to see something and to, imagining, and to imagine it, to act and imagine to act, share the activation of partial common brain circuits. So contemporary neuroscience show, uh, today shows us that what we see is not the simple visual recording in our brain of what we stand in front of us, of what we stand in front of our eyes. I think this is the result of a complex construction whose outcome is in turn the result of the fundamental contribution of our body motor body, sensory perception, and so on. Next one. So, I don't know if you know the, this model. I think you know this model. Mim mirror neurons uh, is supposed to do this. Uh, mirror neurons by mapping observed, implied, or heard uh, motor acts allow a direct form of action understanding, not of real matching the reality external reality with the uh, internal, uh, internal world. No, this is a form of action understanding through a mechanism called embodied simulation. In other words, action observation causes in the observer the automatic activation of the same neural mechanism triggered by action execution. By means of embodied simulation, we do not just see an action, an emotion, or a, a sensation. But these actions, emotion and sensation are evoked in the observer as if he's doing a similar action or experiencing a similar emotion or sensation. This is attunement. Uh, Victoria Galese called this intentional attunement. Or such mapping, we call such mapping embodied simulation. Next one, the embodied simulation the embodied simulation, remember, is non-conscious and pre-reflective. Non-conscious and pre-reflective. It's automatic, okay? So, how the mapping happens exactly is easier said than done. It's not a mere copy, a passive transfer from the outside of the brain toward its inside. I think some other element must be added to construct the whole internal and external reality, we should add, I think, the contribution offered from the concept of the statement of interoception and homeostatic homeostasis, homeostatic regulation. Damasio wrote two books, these uh, last two books are about uh, homeostatic regulation. Next one. Damasio, alongside this uh, concept of uh, homeostatic regulation, talked about uh, image making. He said, the unique feature of brains, any brains, not all mammal brains, any brains, is their ability to create maps. When brains ma ma make maps, also creates images. The main currency of our minds, he said, maps are made when we interact with object, such as a person, a machine, place, uh, doesn't know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Maps are also assembled when we recall object memory, bank memories, and the construction of maps never stop, even in our sleep, dreaming. And the human brain maps whatever object is, sits outside of it, whatever action of course, outside of it, in relation, to, in relation with uh, uh, the, the other one, with each other. The human brain, I think, is a born cartographer. And the cartography began with the mapping of the body inside, not with the map of the body outside, not with mapping the external reality, but mapping the internal reality. Brain maps, remember this, are not static, like those of classical cartography, geography. Brain maps are variable. 
changeable from moment to moment to reflect the changes that are happening in the neurons, in the brain circuits, because it's a, this match with the reality, the external reality, and the internal reflect the change in the interior of the body and in the world around us. Another uh, next. So, for Damasio, images are the mental representation of objects and events in both in the exterior world and the interior world. And I add, images in consciousness are convoyed by feelings, always are convoyed by feelings. Or in case of splitting or psychopathology, made the, we, split, we divide this, but usually images in consciousness are convoyed by a feeling. Why is having images so important? What does having images really accomplish? The most answer is the presence of images meant in the evolution that each organism could create internal representations based on its ongoing sensory description of both the external and the internal events. He called this sensory portals not only sensory, sensory portals. Uh, as the nervous system developed during the, uh, the evolution, they acquired all the brains. They acquired an elaborate network called peripheral probes, okay, that are distributed to every parcel of the body's interior and to its entire surface, as well as to specialized sensory devices that enable us seeing, uh, hearing, touching, and so on, and nervous system acquired also a collection of assembled central processor, and we call this central processor, central nervous system, brain. And this central processor manage learning, memory storage, signals, integration of everything, integration of these signals, and uh, uh, then we go later on to multisensory integration. Before go moving to sensory integration, next one. Next one, I would like to introduce you a really, next one, a really complex really complex model, the generative model, the, prediction mo the predictive model, okay, the deep neuronal networks model. There is a growing consensus in computational neuroscience around the idea that the brain is a predictive machine, which employs internal, we call this generative models, to continuously generate predictions in the service of perception, action, and learning. The issues today are in both engineering and neuroscience, do encoding, I don't know if I have the point, do encoding and the coding procedures follow different and separate paths or are they bidirectional processes with reciprocal influences? Remember, repression and the return of the repressed are the same encoding and decoding processes in practice. Encoding and decoding models should not be seen as mutually exclusive. But this is important, uh, the, the encoding and decoding by direction, uh, thinking of encoding and decoding uh, as bidirectional procedures. Because if we are in the uh, brain encoding model, an encoding model attempts to predict brain response based on a given, in this case, visual stimulus. The opposite. A decoding model attempts to predict the corresponding visual stimulus by analyzing what? A given brain response. So this is active inference. It's not the same being the field of encoding model or being the field of a brain decoding model. Next one. Uh, just for us, uh, giving, uh, just to, to know something about this, uh, just for us, for psychoanalysts, uh, we are talking about multiple representational format. This model, encoding and decoding model, is really important because today we, we know the experiences are represented in different representational formats. That means one content is inside the brain in many encoded encoded in many formats we call this multiple representational format and this is the core of the multiple memory systems the memory is not monolithic so today we call about uh, multiple memory system because a lot of area 
uh, in the, the regions in the brain uh, are involved in uh, uh, memorization. So next one, maybe we have another webinar on multiple memory systems. We know this model uh, by uh, Freestone and Solms uh, papers, but this is a really, really complex model. I think before I talk about this model, uh, we should know what is an ergodic system. An ergodic system is a, a branch of mathematics, a statistical model for the dynamical system. Deterministic dynamical system is a statistical model, probabilistic model. And the core of this model, ergodic system, is the Bayesian band, the Bayesian inference. What means Bayesian inference? Bayesian model means active inference. So, Princeton and Solomon's model are uh, a model of active mind inference, inferential mind. When we uh, talk about uh, Freeston and Solomon's uh, model, we are in the field of inferential mind, not in another field. This is the inferential mind. Uh, why this is uh, really important, uh, this, uh, um, this system? This system, in order to work, needs a mark of blanket. So, ergodic, we, to understand this system, we need to know what an ergodic system is, what a Bayesian mind is, and what a Markov blank is, and how this works. The Markov blank allow us to uh, partitioning the external state to uh, from the internal states. The internal states don't the internal states don't know uh, the external states directly. They know, the internal states know the external states uh, only by sensory states. For this reason, we, we talk about inferential mind. The internal states can know the external states only by inference. And the internal states can change the, the external states not directly, but only by action states, by action. For this reason, all these systems is, is an, uh, we call this system active inferential system. Another one, just to, okay, just to take home with this. Uh, this, is, uh, this model is possible because uh, we are equipped, no, we are, the model, the freestone model is equipped <laughs> by Markov blanket. And this, and this is the Markov blanket uh, which induces a statistical, statistical partitioning of internal and external states and hides the Markov blanket, the latter from the former. So we can uh, know the external states only by inference. This is uh, this implied that the system, just to, to, to give you some uh, statement, very simple. This implies that the system must incorporate a model of the world, which then become the basis upon which it acts. We call this prior. Okay, next one. Uh, okay, I, I would like to, to go on this, this model, uh, thinking about, okay, this is uh, the prior, uh, we have the matching uh, with the external uh, reality, this is our prior, then uh, we have prediction and expectation on this external reality, as Tiziano said, and in this moment we have matching and dismatching. If the system match, okay, the system works. If the, there is some dismatching, the consciousness arises. And so we have the prediction error. Here comes the error and we act on the reality. This is the circle of the inferential mind. But humans continuously receive numerous, numerous, several, okay, sources of sensory input from the external world and simultaneously humans continuously experience internal physical sensation. And all this incoming sensory input require an integrative processing. This integrative processing is multisensory, is called multisensory integration. Next. I try to give you a lot of information. So, to sum up, interoceptive sensation, internal world, okay, body. Extraceptive sensation, the surface of the, uh, the body and the world around us, uh, are integrated by multisensory integration and they end up in embodiment of the cell. 
but I would like to stress this. What is a mark sensor integration according to me? Mark sensor integration promotes the development of a new representational product, not the matching with the external reality, but a new representational product. While it is generated, this product is in turn combined with other sources of information, memory, attention, emotional system, and so on. And then this product, the new product, again, reinterpreted in the light of this very long process to generate what? Subjectivity, learning, and knowledge. And now this uh, uh, end, ends up in, uh, embodied, uh, in the embodied self because uh, of the brain's spontaneous activity of the brain. The brain's spontaneous activity of the brain, the midline structure, no? for the self in this case, links to experience and the living body and suggests that the cerebral activity is independent of specific external process and stimuli. This is possible, the multisensory integration and the brain spontaneous activity like during the resting state, because the, bra the brain spontaneous activity is independent of the external reality. It's independent of external process and stimuli. So in rending, in, during the resting state, and not only during the resting, resting state, the brain consistently consistently, continuously, continuously self-continuity, and then dynamically construct spatial temporal features, waves, delta waves, gamma waves, alpha waves, waves, waves integration, with an ongoing process of changes and uh, that integrates the internal inputs uh, from the body within a larger spatial temporal framework, a larger spatial temporal framework that include the others and the world that include the external reality. I call this the steadiness of the self. The steadiness of the self or the steadiness of the brain means no hierarchy, means the mental self includes the exoreceptive self and that includes the interoceptive self. There is no hierarchy because the vertical uh, hierarchy of of this construction overlap with the horizontal hierarchy internal and external reality. We call this, I, North of and I, we call this the steadiness of the brain or the steadiness of the self. Next one, we don't have time to go inside this. So this is an instead hierarchy. Include. Do, do, See, do, do I conclude. The last minute, please. No, no, I conclude. I conclude. Next one. Next one. Conclusion. <laughs> I allowed. Okay. Conclusion and questions, okay, for all of us. The construction of external reality is a complex process, as much as the construction of psychic reality. Okay. External reality, as seen from the inside, is different from each us or for each of us. As seen from the outside is objective. We can talk about reality because a part of it, the external reality, is independent from our minds. It exists beyond our mind's construction. The patient's exists is not our projection. Okay? So, seen from the inside, the external reality has blurred boundaries filtered by the subjectivity of the self. First person perspective. So, what is real is precisely supposed to be mind and observer independent. This is the objective reality. And I ask you, are future events real? If the here and now marks the external reality, what will be the before and after of the physics and the past and future of the psychoanalyst? Stop. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your view of your presentation. Um, very interesting. And and I, I want to, uh, you know, uh, provoke a, a, a little conversation between us. And and remember that we are in a, in a psychoanalytic environment, you know. Uh, your three presentations, you seen uh, currently the uh, the the oh, with highly frequently the the word model. You know, it's it's a visual presentation with the picture of the brain. You know, process of the information. And my first question for all of you is, how permeable do you think that psychoanalytic field is 
for this type of investigation? How permeable or of that I prepare this type of information? How impact uh, because uh, our core, our classic way to understand the function of the mind. I, I try to imagine, for example, the, the classic of Kleinian model of interpretation or understand the inner reality and external reality. <clears throat> How, what contribution do you project to psychoanalytic field of this type of research? What do you think about it? The first? Yes. <laughs> okay, I, I think, uh, do, do think about this, okay? Um, do things. Um, first of all, uh, um, because uh, with the neuroscience or by neuroscience, I think, mm -hmm. by neuroscience, uh, we can uh, go over some classical model of uh, Freudian, the Kleininian, uh, or Winnicott. Uh, uh, models uh, thinking about uh, the content of the mind and the structure of the mind okay today i think we are talking we are talking about the structure of the mind so uh, in in case of psychosis uh, in case of disintegration or not integration of these waves of this external reality and internal reality in this ongoing process of integration so means disintegration we cannot build a mind. We cannot build a self. We cannot build a structure of a demand. So we cannot talk about the content of the demand. The content of the demand is events, or at least we can consider the content of the mind, the ego, the S, and the superego are object. So I'm talking about subjectivity. I'm talking about a first person perspective, self consciousness. So this is comes for early and then we can talk about content of the mind the neurotic mind for examples i think this is really important and we acquired this by neuroscience okay thank you francisco what do you think uh well it's complicated because i I'm, i really don't know much about psychoanalytic uh, psychoanalytic theories, but I would say that if there is a space for uh, moving beyond uh, a completely anthropogenic approach, which is the classic uh, psychoanalytic one, uh, it only works. I mean, it, it's, it's, it only works for, for humans. Uh, thinking about like the ego, the, the super uh, whatever, or I don't know, I don't know the, the, the terms, but like Putting those concepts into other uh, mammals, for example, is complicated. There are easier ways to actually uh, explain behavior. Um, so I would say that if if it's worth uh, moving from a, a content perspective, uh, which is uh, the, the classic uh, psychology approaches, into more like a process. Uh, perspective, which I think is kind of like inherent a little bit in the heart of uh, psychodynamic approaches. I, I can see it from my ignorance, so definitely uh, is there. Um, if there's a possibility to go into that, into interaction, uh, into some interactive approaches, um, I've I've seen a little bit more on, on this of relational psychoanalysis. All those perspectives, I see that there are uh, a lot of more ground to be uh, talking about. And I think that the, the, the thing that can be taken as, um, as kind of like a new ground truth is the idea of a, a holistic idea of a human. So when, when I tease psychology about like, are we individuals uh, in this context? Uh, the, the fact that basically, I don't know, mental health doesn't think about some very basic stuff, which is like, for example, uh, where do you live? Uh, do you have? How do you eat? So, in the in the brain lesion uh, clinic that we have, we have no idea what uh, survivors of brain lesions, what are their uh, their, their uh, alimentary habits, for example. We have no about the, no idea about that. Um, so, I would say that the one contribution it could be that uh, maybe psychoanalytic approaches and clinical approaches can move towards. 
uh, seeing the individual as a system, as a network of interactions. And I would say with that, yeah. I, will, I will be happy. Yeah, I, I, I think precisely in that, because the, the word dynamic or psychodynamic that, that you just used is a, a main characteristic features of psychoanalysis field. You know, mm -hmm. and when you propose us, uh, or all of you propose us that psychodynamic or psycho, psychodynamic variables are a huge number of variables, not only drives, not only drives, you know, you offer a, a whole world for us. But in that sense, in the case of Pisciano, mm -hmm. I, I, I want to ask, are we prepared to uh, change our currently way to train in psychoanalysis in that way you know because psychoanalytic training uh, if we follow in this type of of information needs to change to understand uh, our thoroughly problems what do you think Tizian? well i think um first psychoanalysis has been very prescient because a lot of these concepts are kind of adumbrated or suggested like a century ago and neuroscience is uh, sort of converging onto that. Um, however, I think it would be important to now with the methods that we have to test some of these concepts in a way that's not just confirmatory. Oh, you know, neuroscience uh, says the same thing that we say. No, like talk about, you know, what is an internal representation? What is external reality? How do we conceive it? Uh, in my case, what is splitting? Is it really true that uh, by resolving splitting, you actually get better in terms of personality function? So um, I think uh, in a way, um, you know, the, the dialogue with neuroscience is important for both fields, but for psychoanalysis, especially to anchor some of these concepts. Uh, I think it's also an ethical obligation because we treat people. Um, so we want to make sure that we're kind of humble and realize that maybe we have to update our models. Um, I like uh, Francisco's presentation because I was thinking uh, all the way through the presentation, although it's not completely related, but uh, Pichon Rivière, uh, the theory of link. Um, it's not very known here in North America, but it's an interesting um, sort of uh, take on the individual as sort of immersed in this kind of larger context. Uh, and, you know, I think it would be important for psychoanalysis to recover uh, understanding of cultural differences, historical differences, what is our relationship to the environment. Um, you know, if you live in poverty, it does affect your brain development, uh, parenting styles, clean water. So th there is a dimension that I think uh, Francisco's alluded to that would be very, very important, um, you know, urban space. Are there enough parks? I mean, it yeah. sounds silly, but those are things that I actually ask patients. You know, they don't walk. I ask, where do you live? Um, you know, what's what's going on in your area? Just picture it for me, uh, just to get a sense of the the day to day lives of people and their reality. So I think yeah. neuroscience has a you know a lot to offer, and psychoanalysis can mm -hmm. test and can uh, integrate a lot of these ideas. Well, you know, I am a historian of psychiatry and psychoanalysis too in this part of the world. And uh, the, the, the history shows that the dialogues between psychoanalysis with, with biology or neuroscience is uh, or, or was looking for some of scientific level, high level of, of objectivity, you know. And in that case, let me uh, introduce the question from the of the audience the first one is uh, do you think that neuroscience is a way to objectivity and let me complete the sentence for psychoanalysis is possible in that sense what do you think well, Rosa? oh Rosa, go ahead. no 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 Tiziana, go. Uh, i would just say that uh you know the idea of objectivity uh, yeah. which is almost this fundamental reality that's at the bottom, the most real thing, is in itself something that is problematic. I mean, it's just uh, 
analytic reality in the room is just as objective as um, brain imaging. Uh, sometimes it, you know, it really depends mm -hmm. on the context. So I would reformulate the question and say that it does help anchor, it does help to anchor psychoanalytic theory in other fields because it provides a sort of control and convergent evidence. But I wouldn't say that, um, not to be too simplistic, that getting data on a rat in a maze is more objective than hours and hours and hours of the patient talking to you and telling you how they're feeling and what they're thinking. I mean, that's the primary data we have, and it's not more objective than a measurable data. That's another, I think, uh, confusion of the term reality that's been collapsed into only things that are observable and measurable, therefore are real, but, you know. So I would say it, the dialogue is important, but I would approach it on an equal foot. Okay. And so I, I agree with uh, Tiziano, and uh, totally, completely. And I would like to stress this. Uh, I think the opposite of the questions. So today, the issue is not uh, how brings uh, um, the neuroscience, the objectivity of the neuroscience inside the psychoanalysis. No, it's the opposite. We are bringing out the subjectivity, the first person perspective, uh, the individuality of psychoanalysis uh, in neuroscience. Yeah. Because uh, decades ago, I think the cognitive uh, uh, cognitivist or the cognitive model, the neuropsychologist model, they uh, brought out uh, the objectivity of the neuroscience. But today we are saying the opposite. No, we need to know more about our subjectivity, subjectivation. This is be human or having a brain, having a nervous system, how we build our subjectivity. This we are bringing on or inside the neuroscience. And the challenge for the neuroscience is this, not the opposite. We are asking to the neuroscience, please ask uh, to us and give us some uh, answer about how we built our subjectivation. I okay. think it is the opposite. Yeah. I would like to add a, a little footnote onto that because uh, if you think about it, neuroscience is, is not any different from, I don't know, cognitive psychology. The big, big difference is that we use lots of machines and technology. So since Santiago Ramon y Cajal is Completely, yeah. his discovery is completely rooted in the new technologies, the microscope, the the, the staining method, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we have been doing this. And now in this internet world, in the the world of wearables and hearables and stuff like that, real world neuroscience appears as a sub discipline of uh, measuring uh, longitudinal uh, data sets uh, non invasively and unobtrusively. Um, for people, and I would say that that's where uh, clinicians and neuroscientists were going to be uh, very close, because I, I really agree with everything Rosa and Tiziano said. Uh, so I think that the next step is going to be also powered by the no, new technologies. And that's something that we need to change in the formation of future students, but I would say is transversal uh, tools and abilities. So basically uh, that they think themselves as this technological, uh, at these semi cyborgs in a way, you see. So people are going to be wearing technology. People are going to be collecting the, the, the data from themselves, and and those might actually help us to understand uh, the development of their physiology and yeah. their subjectivity. Um, so I think that that's it's going to be a very very interesting future. Uh, the, the, this whole technological stuff. Of course, there's a whole political problem there, but we won't, I don't want to go there. Yeah, you know, we, with Francisco, we were working close uh, a couple of years ago, and and in in our conversation, we uh, trying to imagine how it's possible to uh, reanalyze reanal analyze the classic object of psychoanalysis. For example, the case of the of dreams. And, and the, from the audience, uh, does, does the concept of unconscious mean something to you neuroscientifics? How is your opinion about the unconscious you know, concept? This is a main concept of psychoanalysis. Uh, 
What do you think? Every <laughs> we have ten minutes. <laughs> no, no, just just to say, okay, uh, uh, in in which model we are. So in the psychoanalytic model, we have a, a lot of uh, unconscious, uh, dynamic unconscious, cognitive unconscious, and so mm -hmm. repression uh, and so on and so on. So in neuroscience, uh, when we talk about unconscious, we talk about what is not conscious. So what is not consciousness? What is out of consciousness? So we can uh, try to talk about unconscious, but in a different way. And so I invite you to read the last paper of uh, Soms about uh, uh, the, uh, the conscious S, the conscious id is the opposite of the unconscious. The id in this case is conscious. So what is unconscious? Unconscious is all uh, can be automatized. So there you go. So it's the opposite of certain model of psychoanalysis. So. Thank you. Tiziana? I do think, you know, psychoanalysis has a particular view of the unconscious, the dynamic unconscious, motivations, unconscious motivation. I think um, it's not in contradiction with neuroscience at all. Uh, neuroscience, I think we could say that um, with procedural memory, automatized actions, um, you know, has confirmed the, existen the existence of a vast domain of mental life that's not conscious. So I don't think um, it's in contradiction. It's just that perhaps uh, neuroscience has not fully studied um, the particular type of non-conscious experience that we psychoanalysts call dynamic unconscious. So I really don't see them in opposition at all. Um, nor do I think neuroscience has uh, debunked psychoanalytic theory in this respect. Yes, in, in these nine minutes, I, I want to ask you an important question from the public. Is in our currently uh, post-pandemic age, understand that teleanalysis came from to being with us for the rest of our lives. What, what do you recommend about the the channel with our patients remotely using uh, telephones, uh, using Zoom. Do you, do you, do you uh, could imagine something, something different, or the channel doesn't doesn't matter? What do you think? I think it's different. Like I, you know, started seeing patients back in person. I do also teletherapy. I'm a pragmatist, so whatever works, I'll try to do. If there's someone old who can't like move out of their house, I would, you know, try to like do it virtual. But I think the reality, to go back to the title of the conference, the reality in the room is much, much different uh, than the reality on the screen. Um, so we just have to adjust for differences. Uh, and it can be as simple as, Someone on the screen is telling me that they haven't been drinking, but if they're in the room, I'm smelling it. And so, you know, I, I get more sources of data. But I think, you know, we have to be clear about the goals and in a content way, the limitations of the technique. And as long as we're aware of that, that's, I think, good. I prefer in person though. Okay, thank you. Francisco, our last. Yeah. Even though if I'm not a, 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 a clinician, I would say that definitely the, the the point is that whatever goal you have, uh, the technique and the technology will use. Mm -hmm. So uh, interactions can be very real uh, in in virtual environments. We just need to uh, get the, the real technology or we need to get the appropriate technology for that interaction. And probably a phone or a Zoom call is not the technology we need for a psychotherapeutic encounter. Uh, but perhaps virtual reality, uh, there are these new uh, uh, clothes, and smart clothes that actually will generate, gamers are actually pushing the boundary on this. Yeah. So there is smart clothes that are actually you can interact with. Uh, I'm not saying that those are the technologies that we need for, um, for a psychotherapeutic encounter, but probably we might be able to to use technology and i would say that there there's a whole world for innovation from clinical psychology that
that uh, th there's there's need to be innovation in that in that area, and gamers won't do it. Psycho as, as, as clinicians have to do it, you know. So there's an invitation for talking with neuroscience, brain computer interfaces, mm -hmm. and uh, the real world because uh, teleclinic is here and it's going to remain here. So we need to improve it. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, our, our time is up. Uh, I am I am convinced that this topic needs one uh, more webinar, uh, certainly. Uh, thank you very much for your participating. Thank you for the people uh, that uh, joined with us. And the next upcoming webinar, uh, titled Psychoanalytic Emotional Support in Time of War, Part 2, Friday, uh, 14th October, the same time, uh, 4 p.m. in, in London mm -hmm. time, and with Herbert Blas, Alexandra Mirza, Yanda Krapsova, with the moderator of Harold Kluder. Thank you so much. I, I, I hope that we have another option to uh, join together and continuing offer the, the news about neuropsychoanalysis from the rest of the, our field and trying to stimulate it, uh, a, a research, how would you propose, open our horizons that um, in some time is, is more close for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you Francisco. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, Mariano. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Bye. Bye.